Breaking news, Nikon announced the development of their new Z9, a wildlife and sports camera to take on the mirrorless cameras from Canon and Sony. I'm gonna talk about how they compare and what it means for the future of Nikon as a whole. First, I wanna to talk to you about your web presence. You cannot just rely on social media. It's filled with ads and you're putting too much trust in an outside organization. Create your own online presence with your own unique sense of style for your photography portfolio or whatever you have to share with the world. Head to squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out completely free. Set up a store, set up scheduling for clients, set up a private area for people to get their pictures from you. If you love it, use the coupon code Tony to get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. This is the new Z9. It should be released, well, I think where they're gonna be testing it out at the Summer Olympics in Tokyo, and then maybe we'll see a release in the fall. It's going to be the biggest full-frame mirrorless camera to date. Really shaped more like a Nikon D6, which are the primary buyers of this new camera. RC Jenkins at the NikonRumors.com site pieced together this side-by-side -side comparison by scaling the hot shoe at the top to be the same size. So we can see if you're an existing Z7 or Z6 shooter, it's gonna be substantially bigger. But if you're an existing D6 shooter, it's gonna be a little bit smaller, but should still feel good in your hands because it does have that integrated vertical grip. Nikon's only showing us the front of the camera right now, but we can tell a lot from that. And I would guess that the back of the camera is gonna look real similar, though the rumor has it that it's not going to have the lower old style LCD screen. Here's another view of that side-by-side -side comparison to show just how big this camera is. I think it's going to have all the same D6 controls. And from looking at the front, it seems to be very similar. As we talked about with the recent R1 leak from Canon, these professional buyers have been using this same form factor for more than a decade, and they're not likely to switch because if it ain't broke, right? We can see it has the same autofocus manual focus switch on the body that the D6 does. Now, that switch is duplicated on the lens, but these buyers like it to be in the same place every time because after all, if you change lenses, that switch is in a different place and you always have to go feeling for it. I also notice it has a bulb icon on the power button. On cameras like the D6 and the D850, you can turn it off and on or pull it another step further and it will light up the top LCD and on the D850 light up the buttons and hopefully we'll see lighted buttons on the new Z9 as well because that is such a useful feature when you're working in dark conditions which pros often have to do. It's definitely going to be waterproof. Now the D6 it's waterproof more than just about any other camera like it's dunkable. You don't really have to worry about it and that's because professionals often are on assignment and then it stops raining and the professional doesn't get to say, okay, I don't wanna be wet, I'm going to go home. They have to stay out in the rain and they don't want their $6,500 camera to be ruined. It has that big battery and Nikon Rumors is saying that it's going to be a new type of battery. These batteries are typically more than twice the capacity of a standard battery, which means you can go shooting all day without worrying about running out of power. It also has what looks to be a bigger EVF than is in the Z7 Mark II. This makes sense because the Sony Alpha 1, Sony's version of this sports camera, has a much bigger electronic viewfinder and it's beautiful. And it's really the first viewfinder to me that gives me that optical viewfinder experience. In fact, maybe it's even a little bit better. The statement from Nikon says that it has support for 8K video recording. And so does this mean it's going to be 8K 30 internal? I think so, though it's such a passive way to say this, it could also be interpreted as it will output 8K video for an external recorder. But I really think Nikon's got to get it worked out for internal 8K recording since they're competing against Canon and Sony, both of whom already have 8K cameras. So I think it's going to be there. This also probably means that the sensor is going to be in the 45 to 50 megapixel range just because that's what will give them a full one-to-one -one 8K readout without any substantial crop. I mean, certainly they could go higher megapixel, but 
Not only would it make 8K video more difficult, we don't find a significant advantage in detail going north of 50 megapixels, at least with the current crop of lenses, you just start to run up against the limitations of physics. The new Z9 has a stacked CMOS sensor, and Richard Butler over at DP Review wrote an excellent article describing exactly what this means. So you should read that. That's a new type of sensor that the Sony A9 and Alpha 1 have been using, and it basically allows a super fast readout. And in the Alpha 1, it allows, allows that fast readout without a significant degradation in image quality. Now, Nikon frequently uses Sony sensors, and it's not outside of the realm of possibility that they would just be using the exact same Sony Alpha 1 sensor, but Nikon also uses sensors from other manufacturers. So, there are other manufacturers that are capable of making this technology. It needs to be seen who actually makes the sensor, but either way, Nikon has a reputation for image quality that I'm sure they'll keep up here. But something to note, when we tested the Nikon D5 and other top-end sports cameras, that fast readout always meant lower image quality. And in fact, if you shoot with a D5 or a D6, you get worse dynamic range than you do from a D3300. Sports pros do not care because they are not shooting landscapes, because they're not recovering the shadows. They're totally happy with the image quality and the speed matters more. But with a camera like a Z9, at least we found in the Alpha 1 that those image quality differences were gone. It was now on par, which means your single sports camera could do double duty for things like landscapes when you do need the dynamic range. And that means the camera is going to be more versatile and overall it's going to be a better value. The stacked CMOS sensor also provides for lower latency, which is the delay between the time something happens in the real world and the time you see it in the viewfinder. Because of course the light has to come through the lens, hit the sensor, and then little CPUs in there have to process all that image data and then re-display it in the electronic viewfinder. That always is going to take some amount of time, but if it can happen in just a few milliseconds, then it's going to be fast enough for you to easily track fast moving subjects. Now, when I've shot sports with the Z7 Mark II just recently, I found the latency to be just way too much to be happy using a big telephoto tracking erratically moving subjects. I would just frequently lose track of them when I don't have that problem with an optical viewfinder on something like a DSLR, or a D6, or a Nikon D850. The A1, the Canon R5, both of these cameras have been good enough for us to shoot sports and fast wildlife. This is going to bring Nikon into the same range where we can finally recommend Nikon cameras for wildlife and sports. Even comparing the Z7 Mark II, we still had to recommend those shooters stay with the Nikon DSLRs, but that's finally going to change. And while it's going to start with the Z9, I have no doubt that it's going to trickle down to the rest of the mirrorless lineup the next time they revise those. A lot of people are asking, why is Nikon making a development announcement? Just wait until you have something ready to show it to us. We don't need to know six or nine months in advance. It's true, but the fact is Nikon does not want Nikon DSLR shooters to leave for the competition because right now Sony and Canon have really compelling offerings in this space and people are switching over. Nikon is promising something that's coming soon to get people to just say, hmm, okay, I can wait six months. I just want to see what this is going to be. Lots of companies do this. Canon did it with the R5. Sony's done it before. When Nikon did it with the D6, it was about eight months from the time of their development announcement until the actual launch. So who's going to buy this? I think it's going to be mostly existing Nikon D6 shooters, people who own a wide variety of the types of lenses that they might shoot action with. If they're a sports shooter, they'll be able to take advantage of more intelligent focusing systems and a higher frame rate. And if they're a wildlife shooter, and a lot of people do use them for wildlife, they're going to suddenly get massive amounts of extra detail as well as the ability to review pictures in the viewfinder, things like that. It is a professional sports camera, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at the sidelines, you see mostly big white lenses. You see mostly Canon gear, some Sony, but mostly Canon. Nikon has never been a leader in the sports segment. They've always followed pretty far behind in second place, but maybe this will be enough to push them into first place. At the same time, Nikon rumors leaked a bunch of specs and they seem really credible, not like some wish list. So let's go over what those are. Nikon rumors are saying that it's going to have 20 frames per second blackout free. That puts it 
in line with the original Sony A9, but with a higher megapixel sensor. The rumors also say it's going to have a multi-shot mode, like pixel shift in the Sony, something that we have never found to be useful in any camera, Panasonic, Olympus, Pentax, like real world, these photos tend to not turn out very well. You need like very controlled conditions. Nonetheless, it's still a nice to have feature, especially if you're doing something like fine art reproductions, but don't plan on getting super high megapixel pictures all the time in the real world. It should have 16-bit RAW, which might indicate a different readout. They expect it to have 8K at 30 frames per second and 4K at 120 frames per second, which puts it on par with the Canon R5 and the Sony Alpha 1. Should have object detection autofocus, which I think is saying it's going to have a more sophisticated algorithm that can do things like better find the eyes of birds, because this should really appeal to wildlife photographers who have a huge budget to spend and might buy a lot of these things. It'll have two CF Express type B cards, which should make it faster at offloading the data than a Sony Alpha 1 or a Canon R5, which has only one of these cards and the backup card has to be an older, slower SD card. The ISO range starts at ISO 64. That's important. The Sony Alpha 1 starts at ISO 100. The Canon R1 is rumored to start at ISO 160. So this could mean that the Nikon Z9 is producing better quality images at the base ISO. It will probably have more dynamic range, but we'll have to wait to get it in our hands to test it. So be sure to subscribe to see that upcoming review. Like other big sports cameras, it's going to have a hardwired gigabit ethernet line for people on the sidelines who need to just be constantly streaming images back to the press office who's calling through them in real time. It'll also support USB-C, Wi-Fi, and it'll have a GPS unit built into it. Like all cameras should have GPS in it. It makes it so helpful when you're going back and finding pictures you shot at a particular location. We don't have a good estimate on the price, though Nikon Rumors expects it to be between six and $7,000. So let's see how that compares. The specs on this camera match the Canon R5 almost exactly. And the Canon R5 is $3,900, which is substantially cheaper than what we expect the Z9 to be. But the difference in price here isn't based on the frames per second or the AK video. It's based on the large form factor, the weatherproofing, and things that only professionals need, like that hardwired ethernet connection. The Sony Alpha 1 has those things and a smaller form factor, and it's $6,500, as is the Canon 1DX DSLR and the Nikon D6 DSLR. So $6,500 seems to be the price point for these types of cameras. Interestingly though, the rumors for the Canon R1 put it at $8,500. And indeed the Canon R1, we'll talk about the specs in a little bit, it is really more capable in some ways. So maybe Canon has decided to raise that price point. Let's see how the Nikon Z9 compares to the Sony Alpha 1. They should be about the same price, but the Nikon Z9 is rumored to offer 20 frames per second, while the Alpha 1 can do up to 30 frames per second. But real world testing it, we often find that the frames per second is limited by a few different factors, like the shutter speed or the ability for the lens to keep up. Now, this lens autofocusing speed could be a real factor in the ultimate performance of the Z9 because Sony has some unique focusing lenses, like linear lenses that can pull the lens into focus much, much faster. And Sony has been targeting shooting at 30 frames per second for many years now. The Nikon lenses, we find them to be a little bit slower. So we might need to wait for Nikon to release new, faster, designed for mirrorless lenses in order to really take advantage of these higher speeds. Anyway, realistically, the Sony Alpha 1 also often doesn't exceed 20 frames per second. It just depends on how intense you're shooting. So it might not be as big of an advantage as it seems. The Nikon Z9 has a much bigger form factor. The Sony Alpha 1 is just way smaller. Even if you put a vertical grip on it, the Sony Alpha 1 is probably gonna be smaller. And which you prefer, it's just a matter of personal taste. I prefer a smaller form factor and I don't often turn the camera vertically. And when I do, I don't mind holding it like this. But especially if you're shooting with a big telephoto like a 600 F4, it can really make life much easier to just turn the whole camera vertically. The Z9 will be relying primarily on adapted DSLR lenses because Nikon has not released the big telephotos that professional sports shooters are going to be using in a mirrorless format. The Alpha 1 actually doesn't have too many of those, but the ones that they do 
were designed natively for mirrorless. Let's see how the new Z9 compares to the uh, rumored Canon R1. We expect the R1 to be more expensive, but also more capable. The rumors are that the R1 is going to have a quad bear 85 megapixel sensor that when reading in, out in 85 megapixels will only shoot 20 frames per second. That matches the Z9's 50 megapixels at 20 frames per second. And in fact, I expect the image quality to be similar if the quad bear rumors are true because quad bear does reduce the image quality a little bit. However, the R5 will also be able to drop down into a 21 megapixel mode and do 40 frames per second. Now, I entirely expect Nikon to do what they did with the D850 on the Z9. What they did was they allowed you to scale down your 45 megapixel images into smaller RAW files because not everybody wants to deal with these massive images, especially pro sport shooters who might take 2,000 frames in a given game. They don't want to waste all their storage, much less their bandwidth transmitting it back to the press office, so they will often choose a lower megapixel output. The rumors haven't mentioned that Nikon might do that at a higher frame rate, but unless they're taking advantage of something like Quad Bear, it's probably going to be the same 20 frames per second at a lower megapixel, but I totally expect them to provide that option. If you're an existing D6 shooter, this camera is going to offer a lot of benefits. You're going to have the same experience using the viewfinder and the rear screen. So you, when you put it in live view, it will no longer be a completely different focusing system. It's going to be the same system. And you'll be able to review your pictures in the viewfinder in case you don't want to light up the room behind you or if it's super sunny outside and you can't easily see the rear screen. That's because it has an electronic viewfinder as opposed to an optical viewfinder. That EVF will add a little bit of latency. It slows things down. It makes it just a little bit harder to track moving subjects. But if it's like the new Alpha 1 and R5, that isn't a big enough problem that it detracts from the overall experience or really makes you miss any shots. What will make up for that is going to 20 frames per second from just 14 frames per second. Or if you're a wildlife shooter, going to 50 megapixels from 20 megapixels. Sports shooters might benefit from that too, but mostly it's the wildlife shooters who want lots of detail, want to make big prints, and frequently end up cropping significantly. Additionally, the D6 has a lower megapixel sensor. It can only shoot 4K, whereas the Z9 will be higher megapixel and we expect to shoot 8K. I think what's going to be really interesting to everybody else is how the development of this sports and wildlife tech by Nikon trickles into the rest of the mirrorless camera family. I actually find it a little baffling that they decided to release a Z9 before the Z8. You see, Canon will no doubt release a 1DX version of their mirrorless camera, something for sports and wildlife, but first they released the less expensive R5 to kind of show off how those technologies were evolving and get it out into the real world to refine it. Canon didn't jump right into the R1. They had this stepping stone. And a Z8 would be the equivalent of the Canon R5 in the Nikon world. And I'm a little disappointed we're not seeing that first because you're biting off a lot to suggest that professional shooters who've been shooting with Nikon DSLRs for decades should make the jump to mirrorless without first letting us kind of taste these uh, fast, high action technologies in the real world. So I'm curious to see how it's gonna go and I'd like to know what you think too. Write a comment down below. Do you think Nikon can catch up or surpass the work that Sony and Canon have done? Is this enough to make you hold off on changing systems or are you now convinced that Nikon isn't going to be able to catch up and you're ready to go? While you're at it, why don't you set up a new website, something that will impress potential clients. Go to squarespace.com slash Tony. Drag your pictures in. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Choose a template that matches your sense of style because this isn't social media where we all have to look the same. No, you get to be yourself at squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out for free. And if you love it, use the coupon code Tony to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. Don't forget to subscribe to see the review of this against the Sony Alpha 1 and the upcoming Canon R1. Bye.